Ventures, Mr. Pablo Solman. Uh, I don't know if this mic is working. Okay, good. Yeah, so, any other uh, crazy inventors in the room? Oh, come on. All right, we got one. Um, well, I'm a computer hacker and an inventor, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, both of those things and then uh, try and figure out how to make some important points so that I get invited back. Um, so, this is a hotel room, kind of like the one I'm staying in, maybe like the one you're staying in. Totally boring place, except for a hacker, that TV is not like the TV in your home, it's a node on a network and it's connected to all the other TVs in the hotel. If I plug this little guy into my computer, see a USB infrared transceiver, I can send codes to the TV that it's not expecting. So, I can watch movies for free, um, which I know is not all that exciting. Maybe I can play games. But I can not only do this for my TV in my hotel room, I get to control your TV in your hotel room. So I get to decide if you're watching Disney or porn tonight. Um, and if there's online checkout, I can watch you check out, um, put your credit card number in. Sometimes there's a keyboard hooked up so you can surf the web. I can watch you surf the web um, from the comfort of my hotel room. Sometimes people do amazingly intelligent things on their computers from their hotel rooms. Would you imagine that to be secure in any way? I love this. Funds transfer, $25 million funds transfer from a hotel room TV. Um, and then, you know, who knows what other people might want to do in their hotel room. Anyway, a few years back we were working on how to uh, show security problems with Wi-Fi. And one of the things we did is we built this robot called the HackerBot, which could drive around and find Wi-Fi users and then show them their passwords on the screen, which, you know, we thought was good for fun. Um, this is a project I worked on with Ben Laurie to show passive surveillance. So this was a conference kind of like this one. There were different rooms. I put a computer in each room of the conference. It would log all the Bluetooth traffic. So as people came by with their phones and their computers, I would just keep track of that, dump it in a database, and then I could print out a map like this for every person at the conference. This is the map for Kim Cameron, the chief privacy architect at Microsoft, <laughs> unbeknownst to him. I know that, you know, he went to this session for 15 minutes, got bored, went downstairs, took a leak, came back upstairs. I can correlate this to all the other maps, see who he hangs out with, things like that. And that's just because there's a tracking device in his phone that he wasn't thinking about, right? With different gear, I could do the same thing with GSM, with Wi-Fi, with those NFC uh, things that other folks were talking about in your phone. This is an old buddy of ours, Sammy, another computer hacker. Sammy was trying to meet chicks on MySpace. Any MySpace users here? No? It's kind of like Facebook for your grandparents. Very, uh, okay, well, anyway, the point being, it's just like Facebook. You have a page about you. If your page shows that you have a lot of friends, you seem pretty cool, chicks might want to meet you. Sammy didn't know anybody, didn't have any friends on MySpace, so he wrote a little bit of code and put it on his page so that whenever you look at his page, it would just automatically add you as Sammy's friend, uh, which was pretty clever. And then do a couple other things. It would make your page say that Sammy is my hero. <laughs> so he's a little bit cooler now. And then it would copy that code to your page so that whenever anybody looked at your page, it would automatically add them as Sammy's friend too. In under 24 hours, Sammy had over a million friends on MySpace, Met lots of chicks, served three years probation, wasn't allowed to use a computer. <laughs> Even better, this is a buddy of ours, Christopher Abad, another hacker who also was trying to meet chicks on MySpace having spotty results. So Abad took a spam filter called Spam Assassin, fed it profiles of girls he dated and liked as legitimate email, so that's what the spam filter was designed to handle, profiles of girls he dated and did not like and fed them in as spam to train the artificial intelligence to sort them out. And then he ran it against every profile on MySpace and outspits girls you might like to date. I think there's like, you know, half a dozen startups here, right? We can have spam dating instead of match.com. Um, there's a reason I'm telling you about those guys, though, which is that hackers 
interact with the world in a totally different way from the rest of us. And I'll, I'll join either side here. And that's because they're not thinking the way that everyone else thinks. And I think this is really important. When you look at someone like Sammy or Abab, um, you know, they're going to discover what's possible. A good example I use is if you get a new gadget, like a phone, and you show it to your you know, mom or grandma or coworker, they might ask you, well, what does this do? And you can explain, mom, it's a phone. It makes sense to them. You give the same gadget to a hacker, and the question's going to be different. The question is, what can I make this do? And I'm going to take all the screws out, break it into a lot of little pieces, and then I'm going to figure out what can I build from the rubble, right? That process of discovery is fundamental to invention. It's fundamental to innovation, to technology. Every time we get a new chip, a new sensor, a new bit of science, we get to go reimagine everything humans have ever done before. Right? That's what's exciting about technology. That's why every one of us is in this room right now, because we're looking for that excitement of figuring out what can we change and how can we do things better? How can we advance the world? And that comes from this discovery process. If you skip that, you don't get anything exciting. You get the same old crap as last year. So we need to get those hackers out of the security department, put them back in product development, and see what we get. Anybody use keys like this for their car? Bloop. Yeah, OK. The rest of you I know are lying or don't drive cars. Um, so computer hackers have figured out we can drive through a Walmart parking lot. Even kids these days will do this. Click open, 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 bloop. Eventually, you find another car that looks kind of like yours. Same key code. What happened? Well, there's a company who made your car that used to be a car company. And now, they're a PC on wheels company, right? What's in your car? Big power supply and some computer chips. What's in your TV? Power supply, computer chips, phone, power supply, computer chips. Right? Almost everything in your life is a power supply and some computer chips to make it into a PC. Because that's an easy way to add a lot of features. Right? Well, you inherit all the problems of a PC. And for decades now, we've been dealing with this crap, figuring out, oh, shit, better not reuse the same key code. Right? Where does, where's the features that come in all your new products, that come from the fact that it's a, it's a computer now? And so you can predict what's going to happen to the rest of the world that is not yet a PC. For one manufacturer, we figured out how to manipulate the key so that it'll just open every car from that manufacturer, which I've been meaning to like drive by the dealership bloop, and catch the face of the sales guy <laughs> when I open all his cars. Um, but the point is, where's system update, right? What are you going to do, roll them all back into the dealership and swap out a part? Anybody use keys like this on your front door? Locks? This is one of the few things in your life that's mechanical. You should cherish it. Um, everything else that was mechanical is now a pile of chips, like I said. So this is the lock on half of the front doors in America. I brought one. It's from a company called Schlage. Um, but this will work on anything. You guys ever try to pick locks? No? It's loads of fun. Um, especially if you have OCD, you can sit there and finick with these tools for hours and get really good at it. Um, for the ADD kids, don't worry, we have a better plan. I'm going to show you right now. This is a key that comes from Schlage. It's the right brand of key, but it's not cut right, so it won't turn the lock. So I just pop that in there. I'm going to smack it. Oh, we just picked a lock. That was pretty easy. Um, this technique's called bump key. You can see videos of 11-year-old girls on YouTube showing you how to do it. Like, any of you can do this. It's super easy. I made a keychain with what are called bump keys for all the other keys in America. There aren't very many. Um, get into it while you can, because I'm telling you, in a couple years, this is going to be your key for your front door. I mean, it is for my house. <laughs> anyway. Anybody use these USB thumb drives? Print my Word document? Yeah, OK. It's like the new floppy disk. Um, well, mine's kind of like yours, except that while you're printing my Word document, 
magically and invisibly in the background. It's just making a handy backup of your My Documents folder, your browser history and cookies. Everything goes in a little hidden folder on here. Just in case you need it, you can come see me. I usually like to you know, print logos on here, wired, sprinkle them around at conferences. <laughs> uh, see what, no. <laughs> um, just kidding, of course I would do that. Anybody here use credit cards? We know they're wildly secure, right? Um, a few years ago, um, I was surprised to get in the mail a new credit card with a letter explaining how it was my new secure credit card. Um, and it was secure because it has this RFID chip in it, right? Everybody knows about RFID chips. That's the same thing as NFC in your phones. Um, anybody have one of these newfangled credit cards? No? Uh, yeah, come on up. You got one? <laughs> I have such a hard time getting volunteers for these. Uh, <laughs> everybody uses Python for their PowerPoint presentations, right? Okay, we'll steal my credit card, which I know will be not as exciting. Um, since I know a little bit about how security works, I figured we'd buy some RFID gear, crack the crypto, because there ought to be some encrypted thing going on on the card. And if we got the key, we'd be able to steal credit cards on weekends for fun at Starbucks. One of the things I bought was this reader from eBay for $8. It's like the one on the counter at Starbucks. So I'm just going to swipe my ass with this. Listen for the beep. Oh. Did it beep? Hold on. Shit. You guys have the idea about demos, right? <laughs> I used to have a lot of demos that I would do on stage. And um, I gradually started cutting out the ones that didn't work. And um, now I don't have hardly any. Oh, man, I tested this. This is a problem with hackers. They don't have a QA department. Oh, there we go. Maybe it's a card that's broke. Um, OK, so what do we get? This is my expired, oh, it's not expired, American Express card. Well, shit. But write that number down. <laughs> <laughs> the expired one's not working. Anyway, <laughs> so much for high security. This is my, my metal wallet that, that insulates my cards against getting stolen from hackers like me. Anyway. It turns out there's no crypto at all on this system. Um, you, know, you can just uh, hang out at Starbucks and swipe people's asses and get numbers. Um, they used to have the name on here, too. My old one had the name on there. But since we complained about the security, they, they changed it to be more secure. And now it just says valued customer. Um, OK, anyway, I'm not going to talk about security a lot because, you know, that's pretty boring. But um, <laughs> whoops, subliminal message. Um, OK, so. <laughs> Uh, this is a protocol diagram for SSL. That's the encryption system in your browser that secures your credit card when you send it to victoriasecret.com. And what a hacker will do is attack every point in this protocol. What happens if I send a date from the future? What happens if I send a zero instead of a one? Oh my god, it might break. And if I can get it to break in one way, maybe I can get it to break in another way, like one that gives me your password or credit card. That's kind of what it actually looks like to a hacker. Uh, OK, different talk. But this guy is a mosquito in Africa carrying malaria. Kills about a million people a year. Half of them are kids under five. And this is a protocol diagram for malaria. And what I do in my lab is I hire hackers to attack every point in this protocol. It's poorly understood. A mosquito, spent, malaria spends a little time in a mosquito, a little bit of time in a human. It's a very complicated life cycle. What happens if I send a zero instead of a one? We want to figure out how to interrupt the life cycle of malaria. We can do that in our lifetime and get rid of it once and for all. Um, this is how we used to do it. We'd spray chemicals that sort of kill everything and um, hope some of the good stuff comes back. We're trying to come up with new ways of doing it. This is a server that with 5,000 cores we run in our lab to do computational modeling on the transmission of malaria in Africa. And so what's happening here is we run what's called the Monte Carlo simulation. And we compute exactly what happens with the transmission of the disease for every pixel of Africa. Right? Well, and I 
spray some DDT here or deploy some bed nets there, I can compute out into the future what the effect is going to be. And since we have a model like this, we can test our interventions thousands of times in software before we ever do it in the real world. You can see malaria, and this is just Mad uh, Madagascar, which is a handy place to test because it's smaller than Africa. But you can see in the rainy season, it spreads almost everywhere in the hot season. And then in the dry season, malaria goes away almost completely. And we can test attacking it in different ways and figure out what's going to happen. This kind of modeling is very computationally intensive. Historically, humans could never afford to do this kind of work. Now we can do it not just for disease transmission, but in every business in the world. You guys will see this happening in your business if you don't already. Um, another idea we had was, hey, what if we can shoot down mosquitoes with laser beams? Because that sounds like fun. And uh, that's what's going on here. So we track them in real time. And we use a laser to sample their wing beat frequency. And then from that, we can tell it's a mosquito, it's an Ophelis defensi, it's female. And then we shoot it down with a lethal laser. Um, this is kind of what mosquitoes look like when they're flying. We used to think we had a badass camera that could shoot a million frames a second until the guys from MIT showed up with their femtosecond camera. Um, so this is our, our obsolete old quarter million dollar camera um, <laughs> shooting mosquitoes. Uh, that's what it looks like when you kill a mosquito with a laser. Um, yeah, she's not coming back. Uh, here we just kind of vaporized her wing. This is very satisfying stuff because Nobody wants to rescue mosquitoes. <laughs> um, not even PETA has called us. Um, before, we, before we really tuned our laser, you can see we vaporized the entire bug, which is also deeply satisfying. But um, uh, yeah, anyway, the idea being you'd set up lasers on fence posts around a building or a village and um, shoot them down as they came through. You could also use this to protect crops, right? instead of spraying chemicals, an organic photonic pesticide. And we build this out of consumer electronics, the first one we built out of parts from eBay. All of this is going on in our lab called the Intellectual Ventures Lab, where we work on invention projects. And we basically bought one of every tool in the world, hired one of every kind of scientist, and um, tried to figure out how to cheat at invention. Part of it is by getting uh, all the stuff and people we need in one place. We also um, typically try to take a problem, a guy with a problem who's been in some industry for 20 years, we'll sit him down and surround him with a laser expert, a chemist, a nuclear physicist, a computer hacker. Collectively, we know the cutting edge in every area in science and technology, and we're going to use that knowledge to cross-pollinate and invent at the borders of those areas, right? And we get crazy ideas, like lasers for mosquitoes, that you wouldn't get if you were working in the trenches in Africa. In our lab, we do stuff on food. Uh, we started working on cutting kitchen tools in half, I don't know, because we thought it was cool, and um, taking photography of different food processes so chefs can learn. And then we got really distracted and made a 2,400-page cookbook on the science of cooking, um, But among other things. But uh, yeah, so I thought I would subscribe what I've been working on the last few years, which is um, thinking about the way that people eat. And if you think about how Americans eat, it's wildly inefficient. We buy stuff at a grocery store, drive home, cook a little bit of it, throw out a bunch of packaging, put leftovers in the fridge for a couple weeks before we throw them out too. And I started thinking another way that we cheat in invention is think about all the places computers haven't gone yet. Right? At least for me, that works pretty well. And there are a few left. So for example, in every business, we use computers to collect data, analyze the data, make better decisions about what to do, right? Well, we don't have any data about what you ate yesterday or on any other day of your life, right? Computers have nothing to do with how we prepare your meals. And personally, I just think it's ludicrous to imagine it's going to stay that way, right? In the 80s, I would say, someday you'll have a computer in your car, and it'll be awesome. And people thought I was crazy. So now I'm saying uh, computers should make your food. You guys have seen 3D printers like this. We have one downstairs. Imagine a machine like this with three buttons on it. What I ate yesterday, 
what my friends like, where I'm feeling lucky. And you push one of those buttons, and the machine has toner cartridges of frozen or dried and powdered food, and it puts down a pixel of food, hydrates it with a needle, zaps it with a laser to cook it, rinse and repeat for every pixel, and it prints you a meal that's customized for you, that avoids your allergens and dietary restrictions, injects your pharmaceuticals, and makes something that um, turns your diet into an input-output cycle, where we can correlate your diet to health effects, affect your diet in a fine-grained basis, apply Photoshop filters to your diet so that you can get tapered off of sodium a couple milligrams a day if you need to um, over the course of months and never feel it happening. And also to introduce a lot more efficiency back into the system. So instead of optimizing our ingredients for shipability, we would optimize them for flavor and nutrition. Um, so I've been working on that. Hopefully, uh, you know, in a few more years, you'll see some, some actual progress on it. And we'll turn eating into a social thing again, because you'll be able to download what your friends had last night and, and print that out. So anyway, I'm out of time. I'm going to clear out a stage. Um, but I'm going to be around after this. Come harass me and tell me what a heretic you think I am if, if you feel compelled to. So 